Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and you're all around hiring guru. And you know it is my mission to bring you great and just thought leaders that are going to help you either with your job search or with helping your company build a better culture. And I'm not going to let you down today. So let me get right to introducing our guest. So today I have with me Lisa Luckett, who is the founder of Cosmina Enlightened Living. As a 9-11 widow, single mother, and breast cancer survivor, she knows the value of life's struggles and sees the light or silver lining in every situation. She recognizes that life's lessons and grace lie within the struggle. Her book, The Light in 9-11, is in the New York City Big Book Award, is, is an New York City Big Book um, Award winner, and it tells her remarkable story of losing her husband, Ted, on 9-11, and suddenly embracing single parenthood for the first time. And I, I can't, of three children at that, I can't even imagine. So today, Lisa's company, Cosmina, is a lifestyle brand focused on the foundational elements of warmth, comfort, care, consideration, grace, and decency. Lisa joins us to share her story and inspire those facing hardships to navigate life with kindness and purpose. So Lisa, welcome to the show today. Hey, Case. It's so nice to see you. Thanks for it, having me. It is so good to see you, too. And, you know, one of the first things that I like to do, I'm sure you've listened to a couple of the podcasts, is to let our audience know how we met. Because I think it's so important that people are always looking for those connections. So do you want to share or do you want me to? Oh, no. I want to hear your version. <laughs> so... <laughs> Lisa and I are actually going through a coaching journey together with IPEC, which we're actually going to have some representatives from IPEC on the podcast a little bit later um, to talk about the importance of coaching. But we've been on this journey together and we didn't start at the same time, but suddenly we were thrown together in what we call our mod two, which is our second module. And it was so interesting because, you know, everything's virtual now. And suddenly, you know, you're like in this fishbowl with all these other people and you're trying to learn. But there was just something about Lisa that just really spoke to me. And then I found out later that she was an author and I read her book and I was like, oh, my gosh, we've got to get this on tape. So that's <laughs> what I remember. Yeah, well, I remember watching the you know, 30 different Hollywood squares and seeing you basically beaming off the airwaves. Aww. So, you know, the energetic connection, even with, even on, you know, through the ethers is there. It's pretty interesting. It really, really is. And I just want to tell you, I read your book and like could not put it down. And I think I told, and, and then, you know, the great thing about me is I have such a big mouth. So once <laughs> I find something that I love, I'm going to tell everybody. And so I was just like, have you read this book? Have you read this book? Hey, hey, have you read this book? And so I think quite a few people read the book after that. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And you are an amazing influencer. There's just certain people on the planet that just, you know, really are that town crier, if you will, and just in all good ways, oh. to just share these great things that you find. I like that title. I think I'm going to change from hiring <laughs> guru to town crier. Because <laughs> I really did. right, like you're hawking the newspapers in you know 1750, but you know that's the truth. Is there, there's just certain people in the world that people listen to um, because there's so much genuine enthusiasm in in who you are, and you know it's we feel it. Well, I love that. I love that, and it's just and really from my point of view, it's just I get so excited about stuff. I'm like a dog with a bone, and I'm just like, do you want to see? Do you want to play? Do you want to <laughs> see what I've got now? You know, <laughs> so that's where I come from. But you know. Um, honestly though, Lisa, I was so moved by your story and as someone who lost a spouse in the tragedy, I can't imagine how difficult it was for you to, you know, overcome that and find light in such grief. So what helped you carry on through and, you know, find healing for you and your family? Well, uh, the short answer is, and this is going to sound <laughs> not to be quip, uh, that's why there's a book. It's a long story. <laughs> 
Um, mostly, I just want to, to tell your listeners and viewers that it's not as much a book about 9-11 as it is a book about healing from trauma and or post-traumatic growth, PTG, which only came out in the last few years. But it's really about how um, to see the silver linings in our experiences, that they are always there. Are they going to be the same volume as the magnitude of the loss? No, but they're what keep you from tipping into the abyss. It's the beauty and the grace of the kindness of strangers. It's the palpable love of people that are really hurting um, the, with you in the pain. And that's what happened with 9-11. It was such a collective trauma that I just happened to have one of the more you know, ex exaggerated experiences of it in losing my husband, but it affected everyone. And it really affected people back here on the East Coast between Boston and Washington, DC, where it was extremely personal because it was so, there were so many people involved that, you know, maybe one or two degrees of separation made it different than just a news story. Even, even though it was a big news story, but I always um, equated it to Columbine and 90, Nine and Oklahoma City in 95, where they were horrible. And the first of those horrible experiences of shootings and bombings, and we had no experience with it before, but to, unless we knew someone involved, it was still just a tragic news story. And I, th I think that makes, we've had so much since 9-11 with regard to all the mass shootings and things, you know, so it, everybody on sadly is becoming too familiar with the story. And so the real purpose, long winded purpose of telling you this is that it's really about how do we heal from this, from this experience and, and how do we let down our guard and allow ourselves to receive help. So tell me just real quickly, you mentioned a term there that I'm not familiar with post-traumatic growth. Yes. So, so it's not mine. It only came to, into my awareness in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, so you've got post-traumatic stress disorder, right? And then you have post-traumatic growth. Um, there's probably other versions as well, but it, it's basically when you have a catalyst like a trauma that serves you to grow and learn from. And it's not in any way to diminish the loss or the suffering, but it's this dimensional... Um, experience it comes when you're broken so wide open that the that's what happened for me you asked how how i functioned and that is that i was guided and i didn't know those words i didn't know that at all but it ended up being a completely enlightening experience in the sense that 9 11 specifically broke all the rules like no one knew what to do the two prompts for the book were why were we so emotionally unprepared to handle 9 11 and where was all the wise counsel to get us through it? Mm. So that being said, I knew intuitively from the morning of, early morning of, um, that I needed to do and trust myself, that I needed to do what felt right. And that's what I did. And it worked out like, and that's brought, wow. brought me to you today. <laughs> that is really huge. And I know... Um, I just, having read the book, and I don't want to bring back old memories, but I do want to give a little bit of context to our viewers. You know, um, your husband was on the, which floor? He was on 105. You won't hurt me. Okay. All case. <laughs> don't worry about that. Okay. No, this is very well processed. It's almost 20 years later. He was on 105 of, of the North Tower. Tower, which the people that don't know it, it's the, it, it was 107 stories tall. So it was two from the top. Ugh. Yeah. And that was the first tower that was hit, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm swept. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so following in the weeks following, um, what was it like? Was there fear involved? Um, and if so, how did you navigate those feelings? You know, I, I read, I, I was noting in some early, you know, pre pre meets to you know, between you and I on this question. Um, you know what? It was so beyond fear, honestly. So that's what trauma does, right? It's shock. You're actually in shock. So you're protected by shock. You know, it's actually one of those things that gives you some numbness. So I would say that I was pretty much numb for a good year before, you know, so it slowed the whole process down for me because it was just such a shock to all of our systems. And, um, you know, I also, part of that letting go was not judging myself and not really listening to others because I really knew very clearly that no one knew what to do so why not listen to myself? And that's after a long story of spending a lot of time trying to seek 
information from outside of myself. So it's like in that moment, I flipped and saw, wait a sec, I, I have, I have the answers here. And if there are any answers to have, and the answer is this, stay in the moment, put mm. your head down and go, don't look left or right, do what feels right, stay as normal as you can. You go through the motions of life, the normalcy will protect you. It will, you know, it nurtures you and just to not, you know, if that keeps you from going off the rails. And I had a, the reason that my story is different is I was actually prepared for Ted's death in this very unique way. Did not know that, of course, going into it, but now see it very clearly. Um, I, he had walked down in the bombing in 1993, the first time. And so this was my, so terrorism, and I had faced terrorism before. I had seen that he, someone tried to kill them for where they were. Everyone went back into those buildings and knew they were going back into two enormous targets. So call it what you will. There's a little arrogance in that. There's a little immaturity in that in the sense that, you know, who could ever hit us? Well, and then the second piece was that he had high cholesterol uh, by nature and he was out of shape. He was 40 years old. We just had a third child. He was an, I had an infant son who was four months old and he, um, he wasn't, his mother thought he was going to die of a heart attack. Every time I saw her, she would tell me he was going to die. So I, in a very, <laughs> in not intentionally twisted, but the outcome was that I ran his death through my mind all the time. Mm. So at one point I finally bought as much insurance. We bought as much insurance as we could afford. And I knew where all the uh, important documents were being, were, were and, and I, I knew to go to bed and make sure that we'd righted any wrongs and, and go to bed peacefully at night. So there would be no regrets and wow. Did that serve me? So the morning of 9-11 after the, the smoke cleared, if you will, you know, bad metaphor, um, but around 9, 11 o'clock, I realized that I was in this very objective, very clear, very competent place. Um, mother of three, nursing mother of three, nature is not going to let you go down. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's, there's energies and powers much bigger than we are. And they come in these times. And we just, if we can give ourselves permission to let go and follow what we trust and know is right, that it will take us through. So what role, and, and I think you've probably answered this, but I just want to make sure that this question is really addressed. Did the grief and the tragedy play, you know, or does it play in a person's ability to feel confident? I mean, how confident were you during those times? Well, it's funny because I know we want to tie this kind of into a business scenario, right? This mm -hmm. is VIP, VIP, and we want to talk about business because grief is grief is something that's involved in everything. Grief is really involved in all change. So if you're speaking of grief like the loss of a spouse or a sick child or an aging parent, you know, those kind of things, a cancer diagnosis, those things are, are longer term. You know, they all have different modes within the grief itself. The grief is really about recognizing that you know something is changing and it comes in waves and there's no predictability to it so in the workplace or in in this a sense of confidence i would say that they're separate um that the confidence i you know going all i can say is what i did which was stay in the rhythm of life mm -hmm. that i didn't i wasn't in this place where i was in the in a ball in the corner you know in a puddle i was up and fully functioning, fully, fully, probably functioning better than I would anyway, but almost with like a, an energy above and beyond. And maybe that's how my grief surfaced. So grief is one of those things that is you need self. Well, and it is, it's very individual too. Um, you know, there was an instance where there was a death in our family and one of the other family members was questioning why the person who was most affected by that death wasn't crying. And that's because that person had to deal with that in a different way. You know, I mean, everybody has their own, and it's not right and it's not wrong. It's just how we deal with it is our own unique way to deal with the pain, I think. Um, and, and we all experience tragedy on some scale, and it can be so difficult to rebuild and carry on. Um, what advice can you share to help others change their perspective on tragedy to, to find the light like you did in their own situation? That's, you know, that's good. It's a very important thing to think about because we all think about it, right? We're, we're all projecting all the time what, what the horrible future could hold. 
right? Especially as traumatized as we've been since in the last 20 years and now sitting here amidst COVID and, you know, no one knows what the future holds. Well, guess what? We never knew what the future held. And hmm. when we're projecting out, we only see the negative. And what we don't see is the beautiful positivity that comes with it. And that comes in the form of kindness. And it comes usually from strangers. It comes from people that are tertiary relationships very often. And I think anyone who's dealt with some real, with real tragedy of loss knows that the people that you think are going to be there for you cannot be, or are not, it's not linear that it's people you don't expect. And I think that comes from expectations that society says, oh, if something happens, your parents, your family, they're going to all take care of you. Well, in my case, my parents were so broken before they were even more broken after they didn't, they could barely take care of themselves. So how could they take care of me? You know, but I didn't know that. So I had high expectations of them. On the other hand, I didn't have any expectations of strangers. And so what the flooding, and this is to anyone who was around for 9-11, literally all of those thoughts and those prayers, all of that goodwill and those wishes came in the form of energy to me and to all of us and held us sustained. It actually did. I mean, I was not, a, I'm not a religious person. I, it turns out I'm very spiritual, but I, I, you know, always believed in a higher power, but I didn't really have a lot of training. And, you know, but that is the truth that we all come together in the magnanimous beauty of the human spirit to come together in a time of tragedy for anyone. Absolutely. So in your book, you mentioned that pain is a catalyst. And I've heard this from several other thought leaders. Um, you know, one book that comes to mind, I don't know if you've read it, it's called Built to Serve by Evan Carmichael. And he talks about how you find your purpose by finding your pain point. And that's where you serve mm -hmm. from. So, and, and it's just, that's such a powerful statement. And it's said in such a unique way. Um, but tell us what you mean, what you mean by that and how you can embrace pain to help it catalyze your own future. Uh, when I thought about that, so I believe like trauma is an opener and pain is the rocket fuel to get you through it because the pain, we want it to stop. Mm -hmm. So we, in trauma, especially like a profound trauma, like this was for me, that I was going to do every modality of healing, anything that was going to come. Now it didn't come quickly. And that's the thing about grief and about this kind of a loss is it comes in waves and it comes unexpectedly, but I've had other times that have been very painful since then. And the way I, you know, it was really about opening things and doing things you would not necessarily have thought you would do in a normal day, like spirituality, like meditation, like looking out for Reiki healings, like these new modalities of healing that are out there that are available to us and very much being shown to us as a new opportunity to grow as better, to be better humans, to not be victims in our lives, right? We, we, it's not that life is happening to us. Life is actually happening for us. Mm -hmm. So if you can spin and see that trauma as useful, that you're always in these situations by a bigger plan at some level and that in that experience, it's growth. So becoming that instead of it's happening to you, it's happening for you. What are you being shown? What are you supposed to learn? So you shift out of that victim and that, that pain mentality to more the objective observer of your life. And at that time, you can then really start to process, see your own experience and your own part in it, um, gain a lot of wisdom from it, learn from it. Cause that's really what these struggles are for. They're, they're teaching us to be better. Absolutely. And you know, there, there's an, always an opportunity, just like you said, but you said something earlier about happening to us versus happening for us. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. So when we talk about the post-traumatic stress syndrome versus growth, mm -hmm. do you think that's the two and the four, the difference between that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no, post-traumatic stress syndrome is a real thing. No, no, no. And, I know it is real. Um, yes. I think that no matter what you do, no matter what happens to you, if you can shift that to looking at it from the lens of happening for you, mm -hmm. there's nothing else we can do, right? We're in this life. It's happening no matter what, what that event happens. It's a hundred percent choice in how we look at it. Yes. And it's okay to be a victim, right? It's okay to say, oh, wow, that, ouch, that hurt. You know, that, why did that happen to me? 
but to stay there is the mistake. That's so perfectly put. Absolutely. You know, go ahead. Another little technique that um, Hal Elrod shares. And not, have you read The Miracle Morning? I haven't, but Elrod's great. Oh, he's so good. But he talks about one of the things he learned early on in his career was that he only had five minutes to be mad about something. Yeah. And then he had to get over it no matter what. He would set an alarm so that he was like, five minutes are up. And he found as he went through this practice that he didn't need the whole five minutes anymore. So right. I think that's- You a, shift, right? It's a shift yeah. and it's, 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 that's absolutely, and you know, part of our training as well, which is interesting to see it articulated somewhere else, right? I, I learned all my stuff experientially and then went out into the world and found that other people had a lot of the same information and, and received it in the same way which was through me. It's not something I studied in a book. It was hundred percent living it and living it in that level of truth, living it in that authentic, no, no judgment, no self judgment. There were no shoulds in my world and mm. having come out of a world of a lot of shoulds. So, you know, like it was a complete, like the world shifted on its axis, but yeah, yeah if you, it's such a, it's an amazing practice. And I mean, I've, I've, recently been through something really difficult with my one of my children and it was a long window and through the entire thing I kept asking myself what what am I being shown what am I supposed to learn here and you know I've learned a lot but I can tell you at the end of the day with that situation what I learned is this we control nothing and we yep. control no one and That's the right. sooner we let go and just allow it to be what it is the more joy we will have that is so, so true. I mean, and I also have had something recently with an adult child where it was, you know, you're like, ah, and then you're like, okay, we'll see how that works out for you. Cause you can't yeah, control yeah. them no matter how much you yell at them. <laughs> you just can't. Well, and that, and that there's, we as parents, what we haven't been taught in our culture regarding parenting is that they're on their own path, man. It's our job to get them here. Yep. And then we nurture them and grow them. And then they're on their own path. Their path is a different path than our path. They can might coincide sometimes, but they really are here to live their life. And yes. just like we are, we didn't want thing. our mom and dad telling yes. us what to do, right? At that age. No, so. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Um, so as a recruiter, and this is a question I really want to get to, um, you know, I work with a lot of hiring managers and what advice, can, and this is so important, what advice can you share with employers on how to help them lead with empathy and kindness, but especially, especially when employees return after dealing with a grief episode? Uh, the best suggestion I could make is to, and we all do it, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And I, most people just really need to go back to work. Yes. Most people just need to really give them the flexibility to leave if they need to leave. Um, you know, you're gonna, it's, and just to recover. And again, most people work hard and you know, it's, it's some people have the victim lens and some people tend to have the worker power through lens. And, and that's gonna, as a, an employer, you have to let them process. You know, if you have a relationship where you wanna offer help or you see them not being able to turn the corner, you know, if you lose a child as an adult, like that's going to be impactful. Like that's going to, that's a, that's a complete game changer, you know, and, and I've not done that. So I can't speak to that. Um, all I guess is, is to give people the space they need and hold them gently from, from, you know, with loose arms, but, but you're there for them and ask them, you know, just try to let them process. The, I think the hardest thing about losing and we all do it is we're also wanting to help, but there's really nothing anyone can do. Yeah, very true. Right? There's really nothing anyone can do except treat them normally and give them love and hugs. And, you know, everybody has a different reaction to, I, I have a friend who lost his, uh, a wife a couple of years ago and they're very, they were engineers, they were an, very analytical, the wife, his husband and both children. And the, they were so angry when people said, oh, you're doing so well. So even these things we think we're saying the right thing can be taken the wrong way. So it's, it's just give them a hug and you know, I, I don't know. I just think being showing there and being there is all you can do. 
well, it's and I very think, unique. To I think person. you said something very important and you said, what do you need? And I think so many times when something tragic happens to someone, they return to work and I have another friend that coins it grief cooties. They think you have grief mm -hmm. cooties and like nobody wants to get your grief cooties, you know? And so, and it's not that they don't love you and want to help you. It's just, they're scared. They don't know what to say. They're and afraid so, to hurt you. Yeah. They're afraid to bring it up. This is the biggest misnomer. People think that because if they bring up the person you've lost, that you're not thinking about them. You're always thinking about them. So you can't hurt somebody by asking. Yeah. It's just so uncomfortable. We have no training in our culture because for the most part, we've kind of eliminated like regular death, right? We have penicillin, we have cured cancer, more or less, you know, infant mortality is down. We're not in wars, you know, so there's, we're not, we're not really skillful in this anymore. Absolutely. So I want to learn a little bit, and this has been a fabulous conversation and unfortunately we're running out of time. So, but I definitely want to learn a little bit more about your pocket hearts and what it stands for and just what it means to you. And I, and I've got some of these sitting on my desk, by the way. Yeah, I have one right here. I always have them right here. Um, the pocket heart is a little clay heart that I make and I sit at night and I've gives me a great excuse to watch TV under the excuse of I have to make pocket hearts. <laughs> and I give them out as I go out as, as random acts of kindness uh, to pay forward and back all the love that was showered on my kids and I from the kindness of strangers um, and of course community and friends and everyone around. But they carry a special little energy in them and they're from a long story, um, but they are the joy of my life. And I get more from giving them than people who receive them. But the truth is they carry a special magic um, because they're made with complete love and they're the love that actually is that beauty and grace that came from all the kindness that was showered in our world around 9-11 that I and my kids and I happen to be the unbelievably grateful recipients of. So that is in them and that goes out. So there's been about, I've probably given out about 50,000 at this point. That is insane because these things are so small <laughs> and intricate. I'm just amazed. But, and just real quick, I, we've got time. So this started, was it a police sergeant, a chief of police? Tell, it was, tell a, us fire, it was a, a firehouse. Okay, if we have time. Yeah. So the morning, okay, so it's about oh, two or three mornings after 9-11. So 9-11 was a Tuesday, so it's like Thursday or Friday morning. My house and... Pardon the pun, but all the families whose dads didn't, husbands didn't come home in our town became kind of our little ground zeros where people would come for information. So, and I, we knew everybody's, I live in a little tiny town that would remind you of Mayberry RFD. I mean, it's like a firehouse and a fireman's fair every year. And it's just this really great, everybody rides their bikes to school. There's no busing. So everybody knows each other. So my house by nine o'clock in the morning, what had, I had 15 or 20 people standing in the kitchen, just hanging out to be with me, to be together. They became gathering centers. And I was standing at my, my kids were, had taken my kids to school and I kept them very normal. I kept things as normal as possible. Cause what else do you do? You know, like the kids can't sit around. They don't know what's going on. Safety was in, in normalcy. So this friend from church who was the fire chief from a local town over walked in to my house. I hadn't seen him in a long time and big guy, big handlebar mustache and he has hands in his pockets and he now you have to know the backstory which is from the morning of 9-11 like the world trade centers were as important to me in my career as they were to my husband i did a lot of business there i was in new york i'd lived there for 12 years before we moved out with kids and so it was very dear to me and very important so on top of that i am a warrior man like just i come out swinging and I was dying to get into the city to find Ted. He was my, my man and that was my city and I needed to go find him. So this kind of irrational, even though the morning of, I knew he was gone because of the first bombing, there was no smoke in the first bombing and all it was was smoke in the second bombing. So I knew in my mind he was gone, but the heart takes some time. And so you don't wanna lose hope, right? Hope is also really important, but to this, to this story. So I'm dying to get in the city. It's driving me crazy. I'm kind of insane about it. It's, I'm not talking about it, but I've got baby, children, parents, people, everybody's in my way, in my way. Can't get there. It's driving me crazy. In walks this man, Stanley, and he's got his hand in his pocket and he pulls it out. And as he's saying to me, Lisa, I went to ground zero yesterday looking for Teddy. I had this with me and I want you to have it. 
and he opens his hand and there's this little silver coin that's embossed in an angel as an with an angel on it as i take i reach to take it from his hand i touch it and i get full body chills and like i sway like i live like a skin and body chills and uh, all of a sudden i don't have to go anymore mm. because it's like i've been there wow so if you're a harry potter fan it's like a hall crux yeah. literally <laughs> that's what I, later five years later as i'm processing all this i'm thinking about it, that's what happened it's like it took me there and back and i didn't have to go that is and awesome I'm, i mean it it relieved me of enormous pressure. So that energy is what's infused in pocket hearts when like five years later, my kids and I were just playing with some polymer clay where you, that you bake it at a low temperature. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make hearts and I'm going to give them out as random acts of kindness because the pocket heart meant so much to me, but it's going to be more playful. Like my husband was really fun and really playful and really funny. And, and in his lighthearted way, we're going to put this out in the world. Kind of with that intention, like kind of that clear. Um, and you know, it was funny at first to give them out was a little awkward because now this is now 2005, six, and the world's not remotely as, as you know, tuned into gratitude and humility and yoga was still really weird and nobody <laughs> owned and, you know, just, it was just a lot, lots happened in 15 years. So that's the story. That is, thank you so much. That was worth going over just a little extra just to hear that because Sorry. I love that story. No. So it is time for our VIP questions. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. All right, if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you take with you? Well, um, never short of words. I would like to take um, one of the great thinkers like a Simon Sinek, a Malcolm Gladwell, Franz Kafka, Leo Tolstoy, so that we could have deep philosophical conversations about life and the universe. That's a good one. Yeah, because I we got to we got to figure this out. <laughs> we got to um, have somebody to talk to. <laughs> and I feel like I'd have a lot of time. So um, <laughs> the second would be all the books and webinars and podcasts that I never have time to read or listen to. You're just gonna lump them into one item. That's one item. Yes. Okay. These are okay. these are right. These are groupings. And then oh, the last okay. one have to be um, like eggplant pizza from Cano's in Seabright, New Jersey. Because how could you not take your favorite food? I, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, you have to have your favorite food with you, right? Especially if you're going to be there for a while. Um, and my kids, my kids can, they, they can come for a visit. You know, I know everybody's like puts their kids there, but I thought. No, we don't, to. we don't get a lot of kids going. Kids get left behind to no, leave okay. the legacy, you know? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, okay. So really curious, what's one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? I get up every day and I make my bed. <gasps> my mother-in-law would have loved you. She's the reason I make my bed. She totally shamed me into it. So yeah, it's the best. I, I do it. I literally do it on autopilot. I clean, I make my bed, I, I get everything put away and then I go downstairs and then I don't come back up till the next night. You know, there's a book written by a Colonel or something, mm -hmm. somebody high up in the military called make your bed. And he talks yeah. about all the logic that goes behind that to help you be successful during the day. I haven't read it yet, yeah. but I need to. So, but anyway, that's awesome. It, it's yes, for sure. Okay. My final question. If your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? Well, I, it kind of plays back on what we were talking about. Um, something to the effect of because she chose to see her life, as happening for her, not to her, Lisa Luckett became a voice of reason in the chaos. Oh, well, I can definitely see that about you, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here today. How do people find you? Uh, Lisa at lisaluckett.com. Pretty simple. L-U-C-K-E-T-T. -E now, are you on LinkedIn as well? Is that a good place to connect? Yes, Lisa Luckett. There's, there, there are others of me, but yes, Lisa Luckett. Um, very simple. No middle names or initials. Yeah. Just look for the one that says author. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. In a bright orange shirt. Right. Bright orange shirt. There you go. So and make sure yeah. if you do connect with her that you send a note and let her know that you learned about her from the We Are VIP podcast. And I'm sure she will connect with you immediately. I would love nothing more. So, well, Lisa, I just have one final thing to say to you before we get off here today. And that's that you are a VIP. 
Thank you, Case. Thanks so much for having me. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.